As we prepare to hear the gospel proclaimed, let us pray. Lord, you have the words of hope and life eternal. As your gospel is proclaimed and heard today, may we know your resurrection power and life anew. Amen. Our gospel reading is from John 11. It's a long reading. The readings in John during Lent often are. Last week, though, I realized you took a little detour with Tanner Hendricks here in the pulpit, and he preached the story, I do believe, of the rich man and Lazarus. And so I just want to mention, to the best of our knowledge, that parable from the Gospel of Luke and this story here in John's Gospel are not connected. So I just wanted to mention that because it could be confusing. But listen now to John's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. Now a certain man was ill. Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you and you are going to go there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world, but those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, Jesus told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to Jesus, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about Lazarus's death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Martha said to Jesus, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, Mary got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw that Mary got up quickly to go out, and they followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit 
and deeply moved, he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was the cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When Jesus had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and who had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of God for the people of God. It's a long gospel reading, but every word in each scene is so important. It's a story about Lazarus's raising, yes, but it's also a story about two sisters and a family that Jesus loved. It's a story about God's glory revealed and deep grief acknowledged. It's a story about Jesus holding space for both lament and life in the same moment. And a story that helps us understand how we do that too. In January, during the season of Epiphany, we read the Beatitudes from Matthew 5 together. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus also said, blessed are those who mourn. And as we read that passage, we considered how the word blessed in scripture indicates more than happiness or prosperity or earthly security but rather that blessing is wrapped up in the kingdom of God, in the person of God. It's about more than we can see with our eyes here and now. And that's good news because as Jesus's first disciples came to know well, as they ministered to the crowd and as we have come to know, what we see with our eyes here and now can be so hopeless seeming and grief soaked. But his disciples saw Jesus over and over again speak life over places and people who were full of sorrow, the kingdom of God breaking in to interrupt that which seemed hopeless. And as Christ's disciples today, we too know the kingdom of God breaking into moments of mourning. And we have the voice and the power to proclaim life even in the face of death. And so blessed are those who mourn. And here in John 11, we meet three named people who mourn and who help us to understand the mystery of blessedness for those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn while they trust God. Blessed are those who mourn while they trust God. At the end of John 10, Jesus and his disciples had crossed the Jordan River and had gone into the wilderness because in Jerusalem, Jesus had been accused of blasphemy and his life had been threatened. Jesus and his disciples are in the location where Jesus was baptized by John all the way back at the beginning of the gospel. 
we can maybe assume that's where he is when he receives word that Lazarus is sick. Lord, he whom you love is ill, the letter proclaimed. As soon as Lazarus got sick, the sister sent word to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was their friend and Jesus healed people. That's part of what he was out there doing. Healing the sick, freeing the demon to possess, bringing wholeness in places of brokenness. The sisters trusted Jesus as soon as Jesus knows that we need him. He will come. They very likely assured one another. But Jesus didn't come. Scripture tells us he read that letter and he didn't pack up or change course or bow out of whatever he was doing. No, Jesus stayed where he was for two whole more days. And while he was not doing anything about it, Lazarus died and Jesus knew it. He knew it when he gathered the disciples to tell them they were going to Bethany. When they finally arrive in Bethany, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. This means the sisters had been waiting from the time they sent the letter until now to see Jesus days and days. During that time, Lazarus had succumbed to his illness. And when Jesus arrives, it's been four days since they buried him. Not only did he not come to heal Lazarus, he wasn't even there for the burial. Martha is grief stricken, maybe angry too, when she comes to Jesus. In verse 21, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's a statement of belief, really. You are the one with the power to heal Jesus. You could have stopped Lazarus from dying. But even now, Martha goes on to say, I know God will give you whatever you ask of him. Martha trusts Jesus. For him, it's not too late, even now. Verse 23, Jesus said to Martha, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God, the one coming into the world. By the way, this is the central statement of belief in John's gospel. In all the other three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Peter is the one who makes the great declaration about who Jesus is at Caesarea Philippi, declaring him to be the Messiah, the son of God. In John's gospel, Martha is the one who says it here in Bethany. She trusts Jesus. She finds a way to say to him, whatever happens, I believe you are who you say you are. Even in my grief, I have faith in you and what you are doing. We may find ourselves alongside Martha in our moments of mourning. We are so sad. The circumstances are so terrible, but we believe that Jesus is who he says he is even still. We don't understand, but we are able to say, your will be done, Lord. I believe you are who you say you are. Blessed are those who mourn and trust God even still. And also, blessed are those who mourn while they tell the truth. Blessed are those who mourn while they tell the truth. Why didn't Mary come at first? We don't know. Maybe someone had to stay at the house and entertain the crowd of mourners who had come from Jerusalem to lend comfort and sit Shiva with the sisters. Maybe she didn't know that Jesus was coming. Or maybe Mary just needed a little more time and a nudge from Martha. He's really here, Mary, and he wants to talk to you. Verse 28 says, Martha went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. 
And so it's Mary and her entourage of friends and family arriving to meet Jesus on the road into Bethany. And we don't really know much about the crowd of mourners, but I'm guessing that more than one were disappointed that instead of going to join Mary and wailing at Lazarus's tomb, they were going to see Jesus. Oh, this guy again. Remember, Jesus had his fans and he had his friends and he also had people who considered him to be an enemy and a threat. In fact, some of these very people are going to be the ones who run straight to the religious leaders back in Jerusalem to report about what they had seen here in Bethany. And that will be the straw that breaks the camel's back for Caiaphas, the high priest. Mary falls down to her knees at the feet of Jesus and declares, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's the same thing her sister said to Jesus. So again, a statement of faith in her Lord Jesus, who could have done something about Lazarus's death. It's also an implied question, perhaps. Why didn't you come, Jesus? Where were you? Why didn't you get here on time? John spends, after all, a lot of time making sure that we know that Jesus knew that he had received the sister's message, that he wasn't in any apparent hurry to get to Bethany and Lazarus's bedside, that he knew that Lazarus had died as a result of this illness, that he waited until Lazarus was already in the tomb to come. Mary has to be wondering, what happened? Where were you? Why did you heal their loved ones, but not mine? Before long, the crowd of mourners accompanying Mary will also want to know that. In John eleven thirty six, 36, some of the mourners will observe how much Jesus obviously loved Lazarus, but others will ask, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? In the midst of mourning, there are often questions like these, honest questions asked from confusion anger or such a deep sorrow for what might have been and seems like it will never be. And as a reminder, when we tell the truth, when we ask, where are you, God? Why aren't you doing anything about this? We are quoting scripture. Many people of faith have asked those questions right out loud as they wrote their psalms, as they prophesied to God's people in the days before the exile, as they stood with Jesus in the Gospels. Blessed are those who mourn and trust God, and blessed are those who mourn and tell the truth. It's possible to hold both postures in mourning, both trusting and questioning lamenting and believing. But then something else happens in this passage. Blessed are those who mourn while proclaiming resurrection. Blessed are those who mourn while proclaiming resurrection. Mary is weeping at Jesus's feet and it moves him. Thanks be to God, God is not unacquainted with our lament. Verse 33 says that Jesus was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. These verbs in the original Greek convey the deepest of human sorrow. Notice, in this moment of grief, with Mary weeping before him, Jesus' next move isn't to explain why he didn't come to Bethany in time. He doesn't quickly reassure her by announcing what's coming next. He doesn't stop the mourning. He joins it. He is moved by Mary's grief and the grief of her friends, and he feels their sorrow and his own, and he weeps with them. I believe that's always true. We often pray something like, God, break my heart for the things that break your heart. But here, we see that God's heart is broken by the things that break ours. We don't ever weep alone. 
because God meets us in that weeping. Our words of lament matter to Jesus. Even if Jesus knows how the sorrow will be redeemed and how this mourning will be transformed into dancing eventually. To the people gathered at the tomb of Lazarus, what Jesus does next didn't even seem like an option. Death was final. It always had been. Sure, friends and family come when he's sick and pray over him and maybe things will turn around. Sure, Jesus, come with all your wonder-working power when he's sick and heal him like you healed all the others. Sure, we will recognize the miracle of healing when we see it, but now Lazarus is dead and the tomb is sealed, and that's that. Have his funeral, gather the mourners, weep with his sisters, it's too late now. But the thing about that day in Bethany and the thing about your most hopeless day and my most hopeless day is this. It wasn't. It isn't. It's never too late. A little thing like death will not be able to stop the power of God. While the lament was hanging in the air in Bethany, Jesus proclaimed resurrection. Jesus called to the dead man, and the dead man knew his voice. Jesus conquered what seemed to be unconquerable. Four days in the tomb, bound in burial clothes, and the finality of death, Lazarus comes forth to once again be embraced by his sisters, to once again hear the teaching of his friend Jesus, to become one who had a testimony about who Jesus is. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. The people who see Lazarus come out of the tomb have their own testimonies. Many come to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, not because he kept death at bay, but because he met death at the tomb and he conquered it. Up until the last minute, no one, not even faith-filled Martha, who became worried about the smell of death at the tomb, believed that when the stone was rolled away, anything would change. But then everything changed. And for just a moment, lament and life existed side by side. There are many tombs in our world today. Places we visit and situations we encounter that make us think that life and resurrection are impossible. Things that convince us there's no longer reason to hope we trust God, but we lament the finality of what is lost. And every day, again and again, Jesus says, come out, and someone is freed from their tomb. Every day, goodness is found among destruction. Each day, if you will look for it, you will see beauty growing in places that once seemed doomed. Mm. Death is still conquered, and many find a reason to believe. As Christ's body here and now, may we be people who receive both faithful declarations and faithful questions, just as Jesus held space for both things and then proclaimed resurrection and life, may we do the same. May we know that in our mourning, we are blessed that the kingdom of God is near, that our risen savior is reigning over all the earth, and that when, we, when things seem the least hopeful, the power of God is living in us. Lament and life in the same space, in the same person. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this?
hymn of response is, Lord, if only you had been here. The words are in your bulletin, and I assume they'll be on the screen if you um, would stand if you're comfortable to stand. <coughs> Lord, if only you had been here, one I love would not have died. Martha shared her grief with Jesus. In these words she sadly cried. Jesus said, I'm resurrection. Martha, do you? I'm the life for which you're longing. She said, I believe in you. Lord, if only you had been here, Jesus heard these words again. Mary sitting home and waiting spoke to Jesus of her. Cheers. 